First of all, thank you for sticking around. Uh, this has been a very stimulating time, but I know it's a lot of stimulation, so I, I hope uh, at least this will be a little bit enjoyable. I tried to load it with pictures and, and uh, make it a little bit lighter. Um, and also, this is very much in keeping with the, the Frontiers in Neuroaesthetics, uh, which I found out was the title of our, our, our little section. Uh, so it's very much a project that it's a work in progress. It's some ideas we've had, and it's sort of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, but basically, I want to talk a little bit about some research we've been doing on a question of how, and if so, uh, how do we make empathic or emotional connections through uh, visual art. And to talk about that, just a brief overview, um, I'll talk a little bit about empathy and emotion and why it's interesting. Hopefully, I'm preaching to the choir, so you, you'll be with me there. And then um, uh, a little bit about a research question that I think is overlooked or has been overlooked, which is uh, considering art as a connection between two people, not only something that is received by a receiver. And then uh, because this is, a, of course, a, a neuroesthetics conference, um, the research I'm talking about today is primarily sort of preparatory for getting to uh, answering some or investigating some neuroesthetics questions. But um, I tried to throw a little in at the end of some ideas and some speculations that hopefully we can talk about. So first of all, just emotion, empathy, art. Again, I, I hope uh, everyone's with me when I say emotion is probably uh, one of the main or a very important aspect of art experience, aesthetic experience, uh, interacting with or having pleasing or even displeasing interactions with the environment. And just a quick uh, review of you know, the range of, of art that there is. You know, we can talk about sadness, melancholy. You can talk about happy joy. Uh, Tomo talked about uh, these disturbing or disgusting images. And I, I hope you're with me when, when um, we can all sort of agree that emotional reactions we have to art is, is probably one of the, the major differentiators between uh, the different reactions individuals might have to art and between uh, different stimuli themselves. Um, and of course, can also change throughout experience. And just again, uh, by way of background into this topic, uh, if you look at the sort of classic later model or, or the Nadal and later update, um, you know, one of the, the main outcomes of art experience is aesthetic emotion or emotion itself. And uh, they even go so far as to say, well, this is probably continuous all the way through an art experience. You're always, you know, feeling and, and having reactions and having emotions, whether they're very simple uh, valence and arousal or much more complex. And again, uh, in a review paper we did now two years ago, uh, where we looked at some of the major theoretical models of art experience or aesthetic experience, um, one of the, I think, the most constant, or one of the most constant um, factors that was always discussed as an output of these experiences was effect or emotion. Everyone talked about it, and everyone explicitly said, uh, this is something that we need to model. This is something that comes out of these type of experiences. Whereas some other, uh, for example, transcendence, novelty, social interactions are overlooked. Okay, and of course, we can also say, well, what sort of emotions do we have to art or to aesthetic experiences? And I, I, I don't know exactly. There's a lot of really nice work. For example, this paper that just came out in 2017, looking at trying to map just the potential uh, varieties of reactions we can have. And we tried to do a similar one. We're looking at different main emotions that we could have um, when we're interacting with different stimuli. And I, I'll get back to this a little bit in a second. And also for me, getting into this topic of why is art or why are aesthetic interactions interesting, um, I'm always fascinated by the idea that you, know, you could take a, a hammer to a painting, or not to a painting, to a photograph. That's something that, you know, it's, it's just, some ink on a piece of paper that can make you so angry or so passionate that you would want to attack it. And of course, there's very good uh, social, cultural, or religious reasons why you might do this, but I think that's why this is such a fascinating topic, that these stimuli do drive you to very intense reactions. Okay, so that's the emotion part. And then I think also coupled with emotion, um, 
So there's emerging evidence that empathy is also quite important. So I think it's, it's key in conjunction with emotion uh, in art experience. And again, I'm not going to uh, survey all the literature, but just in general, um, I think from the, the late eight, uh, 19th century with the idea of Einfühlung, uh, feeling into uh, the emotional state of another through a work of art, through a person's body, and uh, this idea actually went on to sort of formulate the, the modern conception of empathy itself. And there's a lot of very interesting research, not much with visual art, that looks at um, how, for example, trait empathy or empathic connections can modulate your experience. So it's shown that uh, people have deeper, more rewarding reactions or experiences of art if they're having empathic connections or if they have higher trait empathy. And just one example we did in our lab uh, last year with Gernot Gerger and Helmut, uh, looking at um, some positively and, neg positively and negatively valenced realistic art or representational art or abstract art and then facial EMG. Um, and we found, for example, that, or excuse me, we also um, divided people between high and low trait empathy uh, with this, the questionnaire. Uh, CQ or QCAE, which does a nice job of dividing empathy into five different cognitive and affective constructs. Um, and I believe we were looking at emotion contagion as a, as a major one. And we found, for example, that people who have higher trait empathy showed uh, stronger valence or stronger congruent reactions to positive and negative art uh, with their facial muscles for frowning or smiling. Uh, they also showed more arousal. Uh, they uh, said that they were more moved, had more interest to art. So again, this is not the, the main topic, but it's to show you that empathy is important in conjunction with our emotional reactions to, to sort of inform how we're responding. And I think even more basically, uh, if you want to get away from theory of mind or emotion, you can talk about a, a more basic uh, argument that embodied or uh, empathic reactions or connections uh, could be a more automatic response, which constitutes, according to Friedberg, uh, a basic level of processing. So for ex example, it may be involved in mirroring or responding with our brain and body. Uh, I think you, I, I'm glad that I, I chose these examples because I don't think anyone has explicitly talked about them, but you know there's many. Um, so for example, uh, this, this nice study with Lucio Fontana with cuttings into canvas and uh, just line drawings and showing that in the case where you could sort of reconstitute the hand of the artist or the presence of the artist or have a more embodied connection, you find, you know, uh, I believe motor or parietal uh, activations. And Helmut, for example, in his lab did a nice study, uh, a behavioral study showing uh, pointillism and, and more painterly uh, artworks and had people just do the action, so for example, a pointing action or a painting action, I believe behind a screen, and showed that uh, there was a congruence. Uh, uh, when you looked at, for example, a pointillism painting and did this action, you liked it more. You had a, a more positive reaction. Okay, and I think also I, I was glad it was, it was raised a little bit yesterday and I'll get to it again. Um, you can also talk about that maybe empathy or making these emotional or empathic connections are involved in the initial classification before we even get to the art experience. So for example, deciding if something is human artifact or not, if it's art or not, it might evoke higher activation or reward. Uh, so for example, the, the Kirk et al. study which showed people abstract artworks and said they were either from a gallery or computer generated and found you know, activations in, in the, uh, the reward or reward-seeking parts of the brain. Okay, so that, that sort of says, well, empathy is important, emotion is important, uh, having these emotional connections with art is important, but again, um, art is not only unidirectional, it involves a two-way interaction between a viewer and an artist, as well as we can, we can argue for their brains and their physiology. So for example, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Delacroix, art is a bridge between the mind of the artist and that of the spectator. And really, we should be talking about this, this act through the medium, connecting two people and sharing emotions. And for example, uh, Alfred Gell, uh, who was an anthropologist, um, wrote a great book, Art and Agency, 
uh, says, well, we, we approach art objects as if we have access to another mind, a real or a depicted mind, but in either case, the mind of a person. And we should be talking about these connections. And of course, if you dig out your, I had to go back to my master's thesis to find this, this example, but Donald Norman uh, talks about you know, the, the, the system. So this would be the artwork or the body. And you have a user who interacts with that. And you have a designer who has, of course, their intentionality, their feelings, their emotions, and somehow puts this into here. And then we interact with that. And, and uh, maybe you can have a, a transmission through these uh, through the, the uh, interface of the artwork. And of course, if you want to talk about theory of mind, if you talk about the user side, you have to sort of imagine, oops, excuse me, oh boy. Oh, wrong way. You have to imagine this design model in the first place. So there's no proof that you know, anyone else is sentient. You could take a very solopsis view. Okay, and uh, I also want to argue or say that uh, this point of research was, was uh, noted in a nice commentary to a paper we had last year saying, well, the forgotten artist, why or you should consider it intentions and interactions in uh, any sort of discussion of aesthetic experience. And then finally, to bring it back to emotion, um, there's, of course, many, many, many aspects you could look at for how are we making these connections? How is artist intention you know, making its way through the, the design process to the viewer? Uh, but Emotion itself, Leo Tolstoy says, uh, to evoke in oneself a feeling one has experienced, and having evoked it in oneself, then by means of movements, lines, colors, so to transmit that feeling uh, that others may experience the same feeling, this is the activity of art. And I, I, of course, would quibble with what is art and is this the only activity of art, but it's certainly one of the activities of art. Okay. So that takes us to uh, the, the new uh, approaches we, we've been trying. And just as a bit of one more point of background, um, excuse me, so first of all, we, we wanted to say, well, let's assess the artist and the viewer interaction. Let's focus on emotion and understanding and look at both the artist's intentions and their reported experience as well as the viewer. And uh, one more bit of background, if you do a literature review of, okay, well, what kinds of connections might there be? in terms of emotion. Uh, I, th I think I can argue for about three main ones. The first is, of course, depicted or perceived emotion. Um, so we, we might use the medium, or the artist might use the medium to symbolize or to depict emotional information. The viewer might appreciate that this is a sad painting or this has sad content, uh, using maybe a more cold, analytic, or declarative uh, response. You might say it's aesthetic emotion, so you're having a detached uh, appreciation. And again, you know, the, there's many, many, many examples of, of this sort of reaction you might have. Also, we could talk about, if we do have the, the access to the artist, to felt uh, sharing, or sharing a felt emotion between two persons. And in the, the empathy literature, for example, you might call this emotion mirroring, emotion contagion. Uh, it could be intentional, so the artist could, could feel a certain way and make an artwork about that feeling to try to make other people share in that felt experience. And you could also talk on a much lower level. You might use your you know, gut response to say, okay, that's, that looks right or that feels right, and then maybe the viewer is having the same sort of reaction to that. So, for example, expressionism... Um, Abstract Expressionism, I think this is William de Kooning. One of my favorite examples is by Bruce Nauman, which is supposed to make you feel really uncomfortable and claustrophobic. Or, maybe even more interesting, you could talk about spontaneous uh, shared emotion we have, regardless of intention. So I used this as the, the uh, first example for a reason. This is a, a painting by, by Van Gogh. Uh, wheat field with crows, and I don't know if anyone's seen Ways of Seeing by John Berger, this famous book, and he uses a, this example, uh, basically says, okay, on, this is one page where it says, this is a landscape of a cornfield with birds flying of, in it. Uh, look for a moment, and then turn the page, and then you say, well, this is the last picture that Van Gogh painted before he killed himself. And you, the, you could say, well, there's got to be something in here that, that says I'm going to kill myself. There's, you know, it's a happy, sunny colors. 
it's crows, it's a natural scene, but is there anything that can actually get across spontaneously? And actually, another example could be Mark Rothko. So this is early Rothko. This is, you know, classic Rothko. This is the dark series he went through towards the end. And then, again, this is his last painting. And there's some nice anecdotes from friends who visited his studio when he switched from the really dark paintings to these, and they said, oh my god, you've got to get to this guy. He's going to kill himself. And he did, of course, in 1971. And again, you could say, well, is there, any, is there something that's getting through to the viewer? And I actually found a nice website that has final paintings by artists. So this is Duchamp, Francis Bacon. Look it up sometime. I, I don't have anything else to say about this, but I thought it was interesting. And then finally, we could say, well, there is no emotion sharing. It's just idiosyncratic. OK. And I want to say that in looking for people who have actually tried this, working with the artist to say, how are you feeling? What were your intentions? And then looking at the viewer, I could find only one example. There's examples in music and poetry, but not necessarily in visual art, except for this one study in, uh, by Takahashi in 1995, where they just asked people, uh, make a line drawing about anger or all of these emotions and then showed the same line drawings to other people and said, which of these emotions do you think this communicates? And they do find pretty good ability to, to make this transmission. But of course, these are very simple. They're, they're not nearly as complex as art. So uh, that takes me to the studies that I, I like to talk about. So what we tried to do as we said, well, let's get access to some artists and let's have them make artworks and let's uh, ask them about their emotional experience and see if any of that gets through to the, the viewers. So I was working with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> several people from, from our lab, but also Lauren Weingarten, who's an art historian from Florida State University in the US. And she was teaching a uh, MFA class for uh, curators and artists and art historians and we could sort of recruit three uh, MFA candidates for art, uh, for visual art, to make installation pieces. And of course, we worked with three artists. They created this installation art, and we liked this because it didn't necessarily have really overt uh, symbolic or not, um, representational content. So it was supposed to be about an, an emotion, but it didn't necessarily you know, overtly show the emotion. We recorded both their felt emotional experience and their intentions for evoking emotion uh, in the artist and also in the viewer. And we used 40 emotion terms, which, well, sort of an amalgam of different papers, but we, we identified 40 that we thought gave a nice sort of range of different positive and negative reactions you could have to art. And then, of course, we recorded the experience uh, in a gallery-like setting, so we gave each person a room and had 37 lay viewers go through and then report their experience. And I'll show you some pictures in a second. And our research questions were, one, do viewers routinely, routinely feel emotions that the artist wanted them to feel? Can viewers guess what the artist wanted you to feel? Can artists, so both of these questions, can you call your shot, basically? And then also, might viewers and artists share the same felt emotions even if they didn't intend to? And then we are also looking at trait empathy. Does, does empathy of empathic ability of the viewer have any connection with this? So here's some pictures. Uh, so one artist made a, a, a drawing of, uh, she's African American, so sort of the stereotypical curly hair on the wall and all going all the way down the hallway. Another artist um, made an artwork about three experiences of uh, uh, being sexually harassed or sexual assault that she had experienced. And of course, there's nothing overt about that in here, but uh, with doorways projected and some clothes from the experience thrown on the floor. And one artist, a guy, uh, made a kind of weird uh, artwork where he had some fake grass on, on a dolly and a metal tube and some wires running to the ventilation ducts and there was a TV behind each one showing the 1992 Democratic National Convention and Team America World Police. So again, these are, these are students of art. <laughs> okay, and here's a picture of that one, this one, this one. And then we gave the artist first this questionnaire saying, okay, when you were making the art, how did you feel? Reflect on your, your experience. And we had them answer 
on a typical Likert scale, and then they went back and we said, okay, circle the emotions that you particularly want other people to feel. And for example, this one, we had happy, absorbed, moved, all. Anxiety, self-aware, overwhelmed, shock, need to leave. Uh, loss of self-awareness, sense of brightness. So again, you can quibble with the, the artist's intentions, but this is what they said. And then again, uh, we, we also asked, what did it mean? I won't make you read this. Um, but then for the results, I like to start with this, because I think it's, it's really telling. So th these are the, the, the first two artworks I showed. So the hair and the, the doorway rooms, and then this is the uh, 1992 Democratic National Convention one. So if you say, did you feel a sense of the pre artist's presence? Yes, yes, no. Uh, did you think about the way the artist must have felt? Yes, yes, no. Or on the no side of the scale. Uh, did you have a sense of what the artist was thinking when they made the art? Yes, yes, no. Did you understand the artist's intention? Yes, yes, no. And then, was it good or bad? No. And then when you start looking at the answers to these questions, did you feel what the artist wanted you to feel? So here's the artist answers to all these emotions. And this is, uh, of course, the, the mean of all the viewers. And the circles are the ones that the artist designated as I want people to feel this. So the key point here basically is, uh, when you go from high to low reported felt experience by viewers, you know, the, the circles of the artist's intended emotions are towards the end we would want. This is artwork one, artwork two, so again, sort of the same idea. Uh, artwork three, so yeah, maybe not so much in the middle there. And when you just look at, okay, the mean felt emotion versus the mean, or excuse me, the mean artist intended emotion, did you, for your feeling versus uh, not intended. There's a pretty clear effect. It works twice and it doesn't work once. Okay, so can viewers guess what the artist wanted them to feel? Again, this is just the percentage of people who designated that emotion that I think the artist wanted me to feel this one. And the asterisks are the ones that the artist had actually identified. So yeah, it looks pretty good. Artwork two, not bad. Artwork three, zero people guessed this artwork. And of course, if you look at you know, their guess rate, um, if you want to treat each emotion as a binary yes, no, they're way above chance. If you just look at when did they circle, what was, the, uh, what was their chance of being correct versus the probability, uh, they're quite good except for here where no one got anything right. Um, can viewers and artists share the same felt emotions? Uh, and actually here, I mean, there's probably many ways to do this and if anyone has great ideas, I'd like to hear them. But you can just sort of look at a correlation between the, the reported emotions on all the scales uh, for the, each viewer and for the artist. And for example, you can see again that there's a higher correlation between artwork one and artwork two and artwork three. This is, of course, the mean of all the viewers, but you can also look at the standard deviations for the, the R scores. And so it's, it's on the positive side. It's mostly on the positive side. It's sort of straddling yes and no. And then finally, tied to trait empathy, um, we actually didn't find any significant, uh, which surprises me. There, there is a very strong um, relationship between trait empathy and just feeling emotion, but not necessarily feeling the right emotions. And I think, of course, this would need to be followed up with uh, 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 much more before I can say anything definitive here. And we did also look at uh, rating the artwork as good, bad, and this is a regression. So the main, or there's a significant um, relationship for shared felt artist viewer emotion, guest artist emotion, felt artist intended versus not intended emotion. So it does seem to be that there is some evidence that not only sharing this emotional experience with the artist is possible, but it also does tie to your experience or to the positive or negative uh, rating you give to the art. Okay, and that was the summary. So yeah, there is evidence for emotion sharing that is both intended and spontaneously felt uh, by artists and viewers. There is a tie to art appreciation, no clear tie to trait empathy. And I have, what, about five, 10 minutes is okay? 10 minutes, okay. So uh, that's the, the study that we have sent out. And we have a few more kind of weird ones that are in the middle of, of we don't know what exactly to do with, but uh, I thought I'd share them with you. So we actually had the chance, you know, the cynical take could be, well, these are art students. Maybe they're not great. Uh, 
what if you have really professional artists? Uh, so we had the opportunity to go to the Italian pavilion at the Venice Biennale, uh, and the curator gave us access to the pavilion and said, sure, go do a study, but they wouldn't answer any of our questions about their intentions. But luckily, they had written a book uh, explaining all of these artworks, and, and they had kind of in the description of how you were supposed to feel or what the art was supposed to be about, they used some very you know, nice salient emotion terms, so we could sort of pick those out as the, the uh, de facto intention. And I want to say that this was uh, driven by a PhD student in Helmut's lab, Patrick Markey, as well as Eva Specker. Just, again, some pictures. So here's it's three artworks again uh, by these guys. And the first one was um, uh, a machinery for producing Christ figures. I don't know if anyone actually saw this. It was awesome. If you, it, and they would inject uh, this, what, like, uh, biological gel compound for growing mold and that kind of thing, and uh, produce these Christ figures. Here's the mold. And then they would have them cure in this, I don't know if I can, in this giant bubble thing here. Cure. Uh, they would, I don't know, uh, ripen. Yeah. Uh, and they would just get super moldy and disgusting. And of course, you know, one of the questions we had to ask was, are you Catholic? Are you religious? Uh, and we did. And then, of course, they put some on the wall as they would degrade. Um, and the second artwork was a movie about tarot in a room with some Christmas lights. I'm being really sort of cynical about my description of this. Here's, here's the tarot. It was uh, American millennials reading tarot cards and having deep thoughts about life and what it made them think of. I, my personal take was it wasn't that great, but, you know, we'll see. And then the last room was, <coughs> excuse me, you walk under some girders, and then uh, this is the ceiling. It's difficult to see, but basically there's about an inch of water all the way back in, in, to the distance, and it was just sit, like sitting in a... a cistern or something, um, very peaceful, very interesting. And of course, we could say, okay, the emotion terms that were pointed out by uh, the curator and the artist for this one were mysticism, reverence, and fear, empowered, self-aware, and ease, calm, melancholy, vertigo. Uh, here's people taking the questionnaires after they left. We also did pair it with uh, some physiological data, which I don't have yet because we're just processing it now. Uh, but again, um, his reported felt emotions, artist intended versus not intended. And it worked twice again. And in the, the movie room, it didn't seem to, to work. And again, um, guessed, can you guess from the list which of these emotions did you think the artist wanted you to, to feel? Uh, actually, across the board here, people were pretty good. So it seems like people are quite good at picking out, you know, this is like what I think this artwork is about, whether or not you feel it or not. Um, and again, the same sort of question is, did you have a sense of the artist? So yes, yes, not as much. Did you think about the way the artist felt when making the art? Yes, yes, not as much. Did you understand the artist's intention? Yes, yes, not as much. Okay, and last one, just real quick. Um, I, I'm working with a uh, master's student from actually Indiana University, but she's right now in Vienna working with us uh, and is a uh, trained choreographer and a dancer, which I know nothing about, so uh, this is completely new for me. But she had the idea of um, designing a dance in three parts, and each part would be about one emotion. So the, the idea was you should you know, embody this emotion, transmit this emotion, make it about this emotion. And uh, then she wanted to train uh, dancers from a dance company, I believe, uh, over three days using a method uh, that she'd sort of developed. And I, I have an uh, She says it's a conglomeration of improvisation from William Forsyth, extended cognition co-creation from Wayne McGregor, and memory, Trisha Brown, a triadic aesthetic experience. So the key point was, she taught this dance to people completely without any words for three days, and just moving them through the, through the different parts of the dance. 
Uh, and at the end of each day, we gave them a survey and said, you know, did you f what, what emotions did you feel? What did you think this, the parts of the dance were about? And then after the third day, she said, okay, now I can talk, and then they, they refined it. And she actually has the plan uh, to do this in the future between a verbal and a nonverbal and to actually try it with an audience as well to see if it'll make it through. But again, and here's the dance, again, we do find that the dancers were quite good at picking up what was the intended emotion for the dance. And of course, you could try this with lay people. I don't know if it would work. And I just wanted to show a quick, I think it's a one minute video, if this works. This is the catharsis, or the one part of the catharsis. I wonder if I can speed it up. Like three minutes is okay? I think they're just looking at the... And we had a lot of trouble coming up with music that wouldn't give it away. So it was just constantly this music. I said we should just use a metronome, but we can try different things. But if you watch uh, this dance right here. So she, was, she broke into tears and started crying. And then they all come over and... So this was completely spontaneous. This is just a pilot study they were trying, but... Okay, so back to the frontier. Just to conclude, um, bringing it back to neuroaesthetics, I just have a few ideas, very quick. Uh, so the first thing you could look at when you can move this into the neuroaesthetics question is does behavioral evidence that we tend to be finding um, for relative emotion guessing or sharing ability uh, translate to relative activity in, for example, the viewer's brain? So you might look at you know, your classic empathy areas, um, uh, TPJ, the PCC, ACC, Insula. I know Tomo mentioned that it, there's at least a few uh, art viewing MRI studies that have found activations um, in some of these areas and it might be something to look at, um, and especially artists and viewers. You could also say, does making empathic connections or empathy, um, or even the coming online of uh, you know, the, the awareness of another person or an empathic connection to another person modulate certain types of response? So if, ex for example, art, not art, intentional, not intentional, uh, abducting agency. Do we have to like, put the mind in the thing we're interacting with to have an empathic connection? Does that change? Uh, or aesthetic versus felt emotion? Uh, we actually pointed out, or tentatively said in, in uh, the commentary to the, 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 the BBS paper, that it may be important for enjoying negatively valenced art. So for example, if you have a distancing and an embracing factor, uh, it could be that you have um, uh, safety, a feeling of safety, but the empathic connection is what allows you to sort of embrace this experience and have a positive reaction. So empathy may be a key means of activating um, the embracing factor in conjunction with ex existential safety, which may allow for interest or enjoyment. And then finally, of course, the, the next thing we want to try is hyperscanning. Um, and we have some paradigm ideas. You can't probably do it with uh, an artist making an installation artwork because you'd have to wear the cap for hours and hours and hours. But we have some shorter art uh, tasks that might work. Okay, so I'll stop there, and uh, I want to thank the Evolab, and I also want to say that we have a summer school. Uh, if anyone is interested, PhD students, I think even master students would be welcome. Um, yeah, Patrick is running it. Thank you very much. Thank you.